It's an intriguing process when you're, uh, particularly in an unreached people group, where they are hearing the gospel for the very first time. One of the real eye-openers for Carol and myself was in the very early stages of this project, um, one of the early languages that we did, to be out um, in a very remote area of a country, in a restricted country, and to see people who had never heard the name of Jesus interact in stories. And what was amazing was the dialogue. In fact, I've never ceased to be amazed by the dialogue. You don't teach, you don't preach, you just gently guide the discussion just so that it stays in the story itself. But I have seen the dialogue from one story, like you just told each other, from Elijah and the widow. I've seen the dialogue for, for a story like that last more than three hours with very little translation going on or interpretation for us. It was just total interaction. They, they found all the cultural significance of the story in. And, and sometimes they find heritage and, and history issues related to the story. What's most amazing to me, one of, one of my conversion experiences, if you will, with Bible storying was when I began to realize how accidentally, growing up in a highly literate culture, I had just assumed that without literacy, it was very difficult for people to capture their history and heritage. But as we began to work among these unreached people groups and especially unwritten languages, one of the eye-openers for me was how sophisticated their learning is. What they capture in their minds and they retain was remarkable. They could go back many times for hundreds of years of history and spend days telling year by year of their history. And as I began to watch this process, and I, I began to really respect their learning capabilities and the way they pass on information. And it was a real eye-opener to see that it's such a sophisticated process. What I have on my laptop, or some of you have on your iPhones, they have in their minds. And my mind's not that good anymore. And it was very shocking to see the, the, that they could retain so much information. And so when they hear a story, they almost immediately remember every detail. We have been in training and we, we do a story like that and they tell it back flawlessly. It took me a week to learn that story and they learned it in four minutes. One time, no scripture, no exposure to the gospel. How could they possibly learn that fast? And we began to realize that not only is it the, the learning process, but oftentimes the gospel feels foreign to people. And it doesn't feel foreign when it comes in a cultural way, when it comes in a storytelling way. So it's been a, a true learning experience for us for the past 15 years as we've gone down this road, and particularly the last 10 years as we developed the process, put this together, and began to work with partners all over the world. How, how is it working is a logical question. Before we go back into our discussion, I, I just want to highlight a few things that have been happening since we began this process. About six or seven years ago, you met two young ladies that have been out on the, on the field in different countries. We have now about 500 team members from all different organizations. About 70% of all the projects are hosted by Bible translation agencies. They are actually the largest partner in all of our partnerships. Various organizations, primarily Wycliffe Seed Company and some of those SIL, but many other Bible translations are also involved. A number of church planning agencies are involved locally around the world. So during the last six years, we look back, and, and when you heard Paul Eshelman speak this morning, and, and he talked about all those unreached people groups and all those Bibleists or groups without scripture, a number 
of the ones he mentioned um, that have now have some engagement, by God's grace, are actually teams that are storytelling teams that are out on the front lines of unreached people groups now, but they weren't six years ago. So in the last six years, with many, many partners involved, we now have teams in 230 different language groups. Half of those groups had no scripture when the team first arrived. So they were, they were the worst of the worst. Many we thought had scripture, but like these young ladies, actually they got there and it was a borrowed language or they found it was actually an unwritten language so there, there actually was no scripture yet. And so the research is always being updated. But those 230 languages are spoken by more than 400 unreached people groups. And when Paul Asherman talked about unengaged unreached people groups, there are now storing teams in 178 of those groups. So they've, they haven't been crossed off, but they're a different color now because they, they at least have a team on the ground. And Ivan actually touched a very important point that when we got together in partnerships, working together, this, this will make sense to all of you, but it was surprising to us that all of our organizations, everybody in this room has one, we, we have Jesus in common to all of us for sure, our Lord and Savior, but we also have a very strong common vision. And we found that it's all of us, no matter what we do in our ministry, really want to see changed lives more than anything else. What, no matter what type of work you do, as we walk, talked around the table together, we realized all of us want changed lives because of our efforts. And so what we began to do was, was Bible storying. We, we began to weave together a form of oral translation. That's our Bible translation partners don't like to call it that, but for your sake, a type of oral, bi oral translation woven together with evangelism, discipleship, and church planning from the very beginning. And so for all of your sake, what, what is surprising in this strategy is how quickly we try to form little groups, small groups. Many times it's the first small groups that have been formed that will begin listening groups or story groups, we call them. And usually, the majority of those groups are non-believers. They're not Christians. Today, more than 1,000 of those groups have been started in these language groups. And several thousand new believers are meeting together. We have seen up to a fifth generation multiply from story groups that came to Christ, starting story groups that come to Christ, starting story groups, and five generations of new believers. What's fascinating is almost all of their praise and worship, all of their poetry, all of their drama become stories because that's all they have right now. But we always try to work closely with translators so that what we have begun builds a foundation for translation because we want the whole world to have all of God's word. You know, there's so many thousands of languages with zero, but our, our dream is that they have the whole gospel. They have all of God's word. In fact, we're very pro-literacy. We'd love for everybody to be literate, but we want to meet them right where they are today in their oral culture through an oral strategy. With our remaining time, or most of our remaining time, we would like you to turn back into the groups, or you could form new ones, that's okay. But if you want to turn back into the small groups that you told the story to, and we want you to talk about just one issue, or maybe two issues. The first one is just, what do you think about this? Is it new information? Is it something you've already been doing? Um, what do you think about this, this plan or strategy? And then secondly, do you think oral strategies in any way could help your effectiveness in your ministry. So we're going to give you just a few minutes to discuss that together in small groups. My question is, I, I love storytelling, and I see it as a good starting point 
you know, because the important thing is to be able to establish a rapport, to be able to communicate. You've told a story, so how do you go on from there? Uh, good question. Okay, um, she said she see, if, if, make sure I understood correctly. She sees this as a great starting point to, to build rapport, relationships, but where do you go from there? Um, one of the things that we try to do is have a, a starter set of stories, which is the 30, 40, 50 that Ivan was talking about. It does go from creation all the way to the return of Christ. But many of our groups, or new groups, come in behind that, and we begin to go deeper into staying with oral strategies, but go deeper in adding stories so that we begin to build more discipleship and more specific stories related to the culture or to give them more Old Testament stories. We find most people love to add Old Testament stories because they just don't have enough Old Testament available. And then we, we also have strategies that are more oriented toward discipleship, leadership training, or women's strategies, but they also use story upon story, and they weave different strategies together. So does that make sense? Does that answer? Oh, so I think. <laughs> what I was wondering is, at what stage then do you say, would you like to give your life to Jesus? Would you like to invite him into your life as oh. your personal Lord and Savior? Okay. Thank Normally, the, she asked, um, at what point do you bring people to uh, salvation? Um, normally, depending on the belief systems locally, um, we normally go through the stories, story by story, and allow the stories to build their knowledge of God and move them toward Jesus. We find even in the most resistant people groups, it's very interesting by the time they get to the Jesus stories, they're very responsive to his life, his death and resurrection. But if we had tried to do that in any other fashion, like from our ministry background, it's, it's very literate. If we tried our normal strategies, there would be incredible resistance. Through storytelling, they tend to make their decision because of the stories, because they see people come to Christ. They see people get baptized, usually in the stories. They see persecution in the church, but it's all in the stories. And so the stories begin to, to feed them the gospel. So it's a fascinating process to watch. I, I, in our own ministry, we use the term, it's almost like discipling people to Christ which is just the opposite of the way we've, that I was trained. But it is a type of discipleship where they learn more and more of who Jesus is. It's fascinating. It's just opposite of, of my Western background, but it works really well. Let me take, um, uh, sorry, the light's right in my eyes, but I see a few people standing there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for also giving us a model uh, this afternoon. And I was wondering when I listened to them, how often maybe uh, women would uh, respond like saying, oh, I would like to experience something like the widow did. Uh, uh, is it, uh, when this is God, this must be possible today. And uh, does that, uh, does that uh, come to good reflection or discussion or maybe end up in uh, some problems maybe also? Would, That's yeah. a good question. Um, we've had that happen, and, but most of the time when we've shared that story, and it's been in a very poor area, and, and they say, do you mean to tell me that God will do that for me? And you either believe it or you don't, you know, and you have to say, yes, you know, we, we will do that. I will tell you a real short story. We were in a leper colony, and one of our team wanted to share about the 10 lepers that were healed. And I, I told him, I don't think we should share that story. My faith was not where it should have been to believe that God could have healed all those lepers. So I had to go back and apologize to that team and say, I am sorry. You know, we should have done that story. Who knows what would have happened? But um, there are, you know, you you really put your faith on the line when you tell these stories because you either believe God's going to do it or you don't. 
But the stories are also not told to us because uh, every leprosy is healed and every widow yeah, without exactly. food will be, get food. Yes. I mean, this is That's the right. difference yes. from story to our days and reality, although God is the same. Yes, that's mm. true. That's very, true. yeah, very insightful. Mm -hmm.